You are watching With a Cup of Tea, the High Plains Book Awards edition, a production of This House of Books, an independent bookstore cooperative and tea shop in downtown Billings, Montana. Now here's our show. Welcome to This House of Books. Uh, we have with us today uh, High Plains Book Fest finalist, Trevor Jones, who has a, a terrific children's story uh, called Major, a Soldier Dog. So uh, we'll talk about the book in a minute, but in the meantime, Trevor, why don't we uh, just ask about you. Tell us about yourself. All right, I am the director and CEO of History Nebraska, which is the Nebraska State Historical Society. So we are pretty much your one-stop shop for all things Nebraska history. So we've got historic sites across the state and we're the state archives, the state museum. We do a historic marker program. Um, we do historic preservation, we do historic archaeology, so pretty much anything you could think about if you care, if anything historic has happened in Nebraska, we probably have something related to it in our collections. Holy cow. Well, that's, that's <laughs> um, and, and here you are, uh, the author of a children's book about a, a, a dog. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the book? Sure. I mean, uh, Major Soldier Dog started because one of the historic sites for History Nebraska is Fort Robinson in the western part of the state. And this was a, um, it was a Plains uh, Indian War fort. It was, um, you know, home of a couple regiments of Buffalo soldiers. It was the last remount station for the U.S. Cav. Uh, and during World War II, it was a um, center of dog training um, for the war dog program. And uh, I got interested in this story and what happened in World War II was when the war started, they suddenly decided that they, they needed dogs. They wanted dogs to patrol military bases. They wanted dogs to go out on patrols with soldiers. They wanted to, they just wanted to see if they could detect landmines. But the one fundamental problem is that um, the army had no dogs. They had not a single dog. And so the way they solved this problem was they asked the American people to donate their pets, which sounds crazy, but that's what people actually did by the thousands. And the, the most important war dog training center was in Western Nebraska at Fort Robinson. And um, so this was such a fascinating story. I wanted to be able to tell it and I wanted to tell it um, not in sort of your straight sort of history way, history narrative. I thought this could make a great children's book. It could make a great children's story. And so I started poking around in our archives and I found this um, letter from this guy uh, who had donated his dog in 1943 and his name was Sid. And he talked about his dog Major and how traumatic it was to put that dog in a crate and give it up to this program. And I was like, well, that's, that's a good story. So um, I, through the wonder of the internet, I traced, I was like, I wonder if this guy's still around because he had written to us in the 90s and uh, he had moved several times, but I tracked him down through the internet, made a couple cold calls, found the right guy. And I said, I'd really like to, to tell the story. So um, that's how Major Soldier Dog came. And I wanted to tell it um, not just from the perspective of the person, but from the perspective of Major, the actual dog. What was it like to be a dog in World War II? So then I had to do a bunch of research about what it was like to be a dog. Uh, and so I had to write, you know, think about it from a dog's perspective and then found an amazing illustrator, Ming Hai, who did the illustrations for this and really worked with her so that we present the world in the pictures from a dog's perspective and not from the humans. And dogs, they see the world in a different way because their eyes aren't nearly as important as our eyes are. It's really their sense of smell first, then hearing, then sight, and smell is so important. So uh, the way that Ming did the illustration shows not only the dog's perspective lower down and, and you know looking up at people, but also she showed smells. She illustrated how important smells are to people, which I thought was just an amazing thing uh, to be able to do. Well, it's a beautiful book. And, and the, the story itself, I think, really frames an amazing question. It's a, I mean, it really frames a question about uh, the patriotism and, uh, you know, the idea that a child would be willing to give up a dog for the country, you know, it's, it's a pretty powerful question there. And, and I think that 
Mark, that gets it. It's sort of the reason I wanted to do it as a children's book because I was fascinated, still am fascinated with this idea of um, the sacrifice in from World War II. And I think we talk as a nation about these concepts of patriotism and sacrifice, but they're really hard concepts to get across sometimes, I think for adults, um, but especially for kids, when you talk about something that's that, that abstract, how do you communicate that? But when you start saying, if you frame it as, would you give up your pet to help your country, to help your neighborhood, to help your community, that frames that question in a way that everybody can get to because we love if you are ever have been a pet owner it doesn't matter what kind of pet uh it could be a dog it could be a cat it could be a parakeet doesn't matter you develop that bond and the idea of giving that up with it with no foreknowledge no certainty of return that really starts to frame that question in a much more concrete and meaningful way and so that's you know and that's what people actually did in world war ii it's a true story it actually happened so to ask that question, I think you get at the idea of sacrifice and you get the idea of not the history, not just the history of World War II, but would you make those same choices yourself and how to, what does that say about you? Uh, and what is it, you know, what does it say about the people that made that choice? Like Sid, who actually did give up his dog when he was just a little boy. Yeah, it's, uh, I agree. And it, it's, it's a question that frames it for kids, but like you say, also for adults. It's really, uh, you know, it really grabbed me. Certainly. Um, who would you say is the audience for the book? Well, I, I mean, I really wrote it for, you know, kids that were like six to 10. But uh, one of the things that we've really found is that it's resonating with audiences of different ages. It's got you can find the dog on every page. There's a dog, at least one dog, many times multiple dogs. And so little kids love to point out the dogs. And uh, certainly I think adults um, have really enjoyed the story and the, the historical aspects of it. It has an afterwards after at the end of it where you get to see the pictures of actual Sid and actual Major the dog who was donated. And the, you know, the cast of characters, you get to see what they actually look like because they were real people. And so I think people have, have very much enjoyed that in a more, in a broader way than I necessarily anticipated or, um, but that's been, but that's been really fun actually. <laughs> so. A well-told story I think works for everybody, doesn't it? I hope so. Well, um, one of the things I I want to do is I, I want to encourage people to um, look at uh, a brown bag lecture that you did there at the uh, at, at History Nebraska, and uh, it's available on YouTube. And I'm going to put the link in at the end of this. So thank uh, you. Yeah, I think it's uh, very worth. Uh, very worthwhile presentation. I really enjoyed it. Well, I, I was important for me that the book be historically accurate. That that um, even though you know it's really is a it's a work of fiction simply because we didn't know where Major actually went in World War II. Records weren't kept on that, so we sent him to Italy, which is where a lot of dogs went. So that that's the part where that I can't verify in historical fact, but the rest of it, I wanted it to be accurate. And, and working with our amazing illustrator, Ming, um, I know she thought I was kind of crazy because I sent her hundreds of pictures of what soldiers wore in World War II and what Fort Robinson looked like at various times. And there's a scene in the book where, where the war is over and everybody gets to go home. And um, there, you know, you can see the boots of everybody because they're they're happy and they're dancing. And you're looking at it from the dog's perspective. And and when Ming did the first draft of the boots, um, she sent it back, and it looked great because she's an amazing artist. But I I could see those boots were really issue boots from 1943, and not issue boots from 1945. Uh, and this was this was May of 45. So I was like, well, they need to be like this boot, these boots. And so I sent her pictures of boots from our collection that soldiers had worn and at the end of the war. And and so she illustrated those to look that way. And no. Nobody cares about that but me, uh, quite honestly, but I felt like it's important that if you're doing a, a historical uh, work that people could rely on the fact that you got those details right, like that, that there, was, there was something behind that. And that was really important for me uh, to put that into the, the images and, and also you know, the text to make sure that we were representing things as it happened or as close as we could get to. And, and so that was, that was the big, big joy. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us. This is just a, a stunning book and a really gripping story. So uh, I, I, I would recommend it to anybody. It was, it was fun. And if you need uh, additional details, if anybody wants to see what Fort Robinson really looked like in, in World War II, if they go to um, the website for History Nebraska, history.nebraska.gov, you can just put in Fort Robinson or War Dog Program into the search bar and you'll see pictures of what it looked like. And I think we've got some pictures of what it looks like today because it's still a place you can visit. It's an absolutely gorgeous place in Nebraska. Um, it's completely stunning and you can go stay in a Adobe's uh, Adobe officers quarters from the 1880s. And I don't know where else in the world you can do that. It's, it's just a magical place. Well, thanks so much. Well, thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. This program has been produced by this house of books in collaboration with the High Plains Book Awards. The book awards were established to recognize regional authors and literary work that examines life on the High Plains. Nominations will be accepted starting in January 2021 on the website highplainsbookawards.org.